disabled thing again, Luke. Oh, sorry about that. Bro? There you go. All right. And did you start recording? Yep, I did. Awesome. <laughs> you, you know me too well. <laughs> the sound I get sidetracked with people. Of thing I would have done. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to part two of our star migrants talk, uh, all about bird migration. Um, Nicole and I did try to make this so that if you hadn't seen part one, you wouldn't be totally lost or anything. So um, we'll see how we did it. And there's a few times I'm gonna have to backtrack slightly and explain, but this is uh, a different topic, especially in terms of scale. So on our talk, the part one talk, we focused on star migrant birds, especially from the point of view of the scale of, of Arizona. But now we're gonna take a step back uh, from a higher bird's eye view and talk about uh, bird migration on a hemisphere level, which is actually incredibly fascinating. Okay, so I am Jenny McFarland, the bird conservation biologist on staff for Tucson Audubon, and um, co-presenter for the talk is Nicole Gillette, the conservation advocate on staff for Tucson Audubon. Who remembers this map on the left? This is, uh, was on my bedroom wall for many, many years. This came out decades ago from National Geographic. This, this white graphic on the left was a map that was a free insert into National Geographic magazines uh, periodically for, for many, many years. I've seen this poster-sized graphic in many a biologist's office, <laughs> many a, uh, and I'm sure it was in many a person's home. It's a really cool map uh, from back in the day that showed pathways of different migrating bird species in the Western Hemisphere and really, I think, did a really good job conveying the fact that many species uh, move through the, the globe on a scale that's kind of difficult to relate to unless you're looking at a scale like this where you're seeing an entire hemisphere in one field, which is why this was a poster. It was so huge graphic um, that folded out from a National Geographic magazine. This one on the right is their more modern, sort of the, the redo on this, the more modern take with a, some more information, some more data, uh, but definitely with the same goal of trying to um, convey that some of these birds migrate on just a huge geographic scale. And this is the, the new version for the, the Eastern Hemisphere. Because, uh, you know, living here in the United States, you know, we think about migration uh, within the Western Hemisphere very often. We see migrating birds, but it, the same sort of deal happens in the, the Eastern Hemisphere as well. So this is a map we looked at um, last time. So this is a map that was generated from uh, eBird data. And we are gonna talk quite a lot about eBird. And we covered it a lot uh, in the first class, but I just wanna mention briefly in case we have some, some new folks for part two. You know, eBird is a, a free service. It's a website from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. You can create a free account, go on there and put in some bird sightings. And even if you don't wanna do that, you can explore a lot of these great features that eBird has, so grazing amazing cool maps and all sorts of great information. Uh, which we're going to talk about later in the talk, but this is a particularly cool graphic that's been going around uh, for a while in the birding community. It shows 118 species. Each of, the, each of these dots represents a migrating bird species and sort of their average movements throughout a year, based showing their speed and location uh, of movement on any day. So the little comet tails coming out of each dot is sort of signifying the speed at which that bird is moving. So it's going to start again with the new year, so January 1st. You can see some birds move very, very quickly in winter. Some take their time, some kind of wander east before going northwest. Uh, so it's a really cool graphic showing just some of the different strategies that birds have in the Western Hemisphere, but also just showing the power of huge databases to create these amazing graphics. And we did show this last time, but I do have something new for you guys who have already seen this. I uh, realize that eBird has a key on this. So this is a page that you can go to. So Luke, this is where we should share that, that link in the chat window. This is a graphic showing you which birds each of those dots represent. So now you can see which numbers, like, oh, that's, what's that one that's wandering way over? What's number nine that's following, tracking the eastern coast down? And look at the key and see that that's Bicknell's thrush. So this is a really cool thing to look at, which even gives more information behind that amazing graphic that you see 
around of birds migrating. So this is just one that you can check out and really spend some time staring at and seeing what's going on with some of these species. It's really very, very cool. So bird migration is very complicated. It's very complex. Uh, there's a billions of birds moving seasonally, you know, every year, both, you know, going north for, for breeding and then south for, for wintering. And it's very difficult from a science and a research point of view to tackle such a huge topic. So things tend to get broken down. So this is a map that has a lot going on, but it's still just a small component of uh, Western Hemisphere bird migration. This is showing the, the migratory pathways of birds that breed in the boreal forest. That's it, <laughs> birds that breed in the boreal forest. And it also is doing a good job showing the different flyways. So North America, the Western Hemisphere bird migration has been organized into distinctive flyways by uh, researchers and scientists just so we can begin to understand uh, what's going on because different things happen in the different flyways, different strategies. So the pink arrows are the what we call the Western flyway, uh, which is often Arizona is considered a part of. Um, there's also the Central flyway, which depending on which Cat, like, um, which source you're looking at. Sometimes Arizona falls in the central flyway, but uh, I tend to think of it more of a western flyway. And then the eastern flyway, which is very, very large, can track the eastern coast or even just curve out over the Atlantic Ocean itself. So there's a lot of different ways to, to look at uh, bird migration and try to try to organize just the vast movements of many, many species and also just billions of individual birds. There's another really cool very beautiful graphic showing just some of the different pathways that different species take in the Western Hemisphere. And I really like this graphic because it conveys, I think, very nicely that bird migration um, is, is amazing. It's fascinating to research. There's so many components of it, uh, which is why I really hope we do more sessions about this since it's a fascinating topic and we're going to just barely scratch the surface of some of the more fascinating aspects of it uh, in this talk today. But, and it is really quite beautiful, and it just as this graphic shows. It's very, very dynamic. <laughs> These birds, you know, billions of individual species surging, not exactly the same direction, but the same general direction. So this is a, a spring migration showing birds surging north, um, some tracking east, some going straight north, some tracking west, and it's incredibly complicated. And new technology and, new computer modeling methods have really helped us begin to get a better grasp of just how complicated and amazing it is. So we find bird migration fascinating, you know, as people especially who, who look at birds, you know, birders or bird appreciators, my favorite type of birder, um, are fascinated by it. You know, birds come and go, it's an amazing thing, and humans have been noticing it since the beginning of time. So there's been many different approaches to trying to understand what is happening with uh, birds, especially birds that are there during certain parts of the year and then gone the other parts of the year. Back then, you know, back in the day, people couldn't move around the way we can now or share information the way we do now. So just some, some interesting tidbits from how humans of the past tried to figure out what was going on with these birds. You know, the ancient Greeks deduced that swallows left you know, Greece, and that they went somewhere hot, since they knew from reports of uh, traveling information, that swallows could be found year-round in Egypt. So they deduced if that was the case, and it's colder in the winter in Greece, that they went somewhere warm. And they were correct, that is exactly right. But Aristotle, uh, a famous, you know, thoughtful Greek, went a bit further and postulated that perhaps many species hibernated in trees, or uh, or under the under the mud even. There was a theory with swallows that they went to the bottom of ponds and burrowed under the mud like fish. And uh, perhaps they even underwent transformations. Some species that you saw in the spring and summer and then were replaced by wintering species that you only saw in the winter, perhaps those were the same bird and they just underwent a transformation, a yearly transformation. So people came up with some pretty creative explanations for, for what they were seeing, the fact that birds were there and then they weren't there and then they came back, which is such a, a, a noticeable phenomenon. And these were just some of the amazing explanations people, very creative explanations people had. But I think the most creative explanation came from Charles Morton, who was a, a mathematician. From what I could find uh, about him historically, he was a pretty 
highly regarded mathematician, was uh, alive in the 1600s. He was from England and then uh, immigrated to the North American colonies of Britain. This is pre-United States. And he was actually the first vice president of the Harvard University. So this was not a very stupid guy. This is a very smart guy. And he had a very interesting theory on bird migration that he very well reasoned out and actually published a paper on. And his theory was that birds flew to the moon, that they literally migrated by flying to the moon. He calculated the speed at which birds would have to fly. He tried to calculate the distance the moon was from the earth. It actually came pretty close in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of scale, got within a few, you know, hundred thousand miles of how far away the moon was and uh, got, I've had a very well-reasoned theory that we now know to not be correct, but I think wins for the creativity uh, category of where birds go. So we know a lot more now. <laughs> Humans understand much more about what's going on with bird movements. And a lot of this has to do with just people traveling around more, sharing of, of sightings and observations, but also in more recent times, this has a lot to do with science and technology. So technology has really, really improved over the last, even just several years, has really improved to the point where we can put little devices on the physical bodies of birds and get information on their movements. So this bubble link on the left has a very small device attached. Uh, these tend to work with, if you've ever seen a wildlife biologist do this, sometimes uh, these transmitters with little antennas will sometimes be attached directly to a feather. Like sometimes they'll be glued to a tail feather that uh, then they know will be shed at some point so that it doesn't stay on the bird forever. But more often they are attached using what biologists call backpack straps. So literally a little, like they wear like a little backpack on their back and it has little straps that go around through sort of through their they don't have arms, but they're little wing pits, you know, like we would wear a little backpack. And it sits real secure and snug on their backs. And um, there's often a lot of precautions that go along with this, where the, the, the fibers that they use to make the straps are of a sort that will dissolve over time, usually organic cotton, so that the, um, the device can be shed off the bird over time so they're not stuck with it forever. So lots of precautions are taken to try to ensure the safety, to ensure the safety of these birds. But these devices are amazing. So there's different categories of devices. On very small birds, like on this Bobolink, these are um, smaller devices that don't have a big antenna. And what those are doing is using satellite technology, a uh, sort of GPS technology, like a GPS handheld unit would use, or even your cell phone, because it's very, very tiny technology with a little battery in there. And that is using a very low battery method of literally pinging the satellites uh, the location of the bird usually once a day and then storing that information in the device. Now what that means is that it can have a very small battery because it's not transmitting to up to satellites or anything it's just recording a data point. What that means though is you have to catch that bird again. <laughs> you have to relocate that bird, catch it, get the device off of it and then download the data. So that's probably one of the least invasive, the smallest devices you can put on birds. So that's typically what's used for songbirds or little tiny birds uh, these days. And, but it does rely on you catching that bird again. So you, you, know, you send out 50 birds with this on and you might get 10 back sort of thing. But you can get a lot of good data that way. And these are also relatively low cost devices. And then you have these more expensive <laughs> devices that are a little bit bigger that have a larger battery and have a long antenna that can then send out signals that are actually picked up by a receiver. And how that works uh, depends on the size of the device and exactly what's going on. So this here is a, a little clover with one with an antenna, and this could be even just picked up by a handheld um, you know, receiver, or this larger one on a yellow-billed cuckoo, uh, because it's a little bit bigger bird, you can put a bigger device on it, and these sometimes actually will talk to sometimes cell phone towers and transmit data without you having to actually recapture the bird, or very cutting edge, uh, a study that was going on last summer with yellow-billed cuckoos, using devices that could actually upload data points to satellites in real time so that the researchers could see today where their cuckoo was hanging out. So technology is really, really getting amazing with, um, with what we can find out with birds in real time. So another really exciting cutting edge thing that's going on with bird migration technology is what we call MODIS. 
So I had that, that word there at the, uh, before, M-O-T-U-S, modus. And this depends on antennas. So this is a modus antenna right here. They're actually relatively low cost devices, you know, several thousand dollars, you can put up a modus tower. And it does an amazing job capturing um, the signals of these little tags that you can put on birds that are very small, lightweight, low battery tags that you can put on a little bird. And then it gets close to a tower, it documents the fact that that bird flew within a certain radius of that tower. So this depends on putting a lot of towers out. And this is a map showing back in 2016 where MODIS towers have been installed in, um, in the Western Hemisphere. And I've, I know I couldn't find a graphic online, but I've seen from internal presentations of uh, biologist meetings that there's been a huge emphasis on getting more towers in Mexico, which is sorely missing on this map from 2016. But many towers have now been installed in Mexico, and there's a big push to get some in Arizona and along the, the Pacific coast. Uh, so there's a big push to get more information on the west, but they've done a good job putting a lot of these towers up on the eastern flyway, and they get a huge amount of data. So this is a map showing where this particular, where some great cheeked brushes that were tagged with modus tags, where they pinged on certain towers. So this doesn't give you as much information as a GPS tracker, because we can only do sort of direct line. We don't know where that bird was every day, just that it hit this tower, and then that tower on a certain date, and you draw a straight line. Uh, but it still gives you a huge amount of data for pretty low cost and really low impact on the birds because these are tiny tags that go on them. So this was a story that I thought was amazing that I'm sure many of you uh, may have encountered last year. It was this last winter of this story about golden eagle that these Russian golden eagles that were tagged and had these, these devices on them that talked to cell phone towers and how one golden eagle went from Iran. He flew into Iran from Kazakhstan, which meant he was then racking up roaming charges <laughs> on his device and cost, ended up uh, racking up a bill for the biologists, the Russian biologists who were studying these birds of $1,500, which was this amazing, hilarious story that we got shared all over the internet. It was so funny. But this is a, this is a photo right here. This is a photo here of one of those eagles with one of those devices and you can kind of see what they look like they have a little solar panel this is a larger bird so you can put a little solar panel so that the uh, you can put a smaller battery with a little pa solar panel so that this device lasts for a long time on these birds and this story got a big splash because it was hilarious it was really funny but it also was amazing science. And I was really glad to see this hit the mainstream because then people could read about some of this amazing migration science. And this is a map I got, I just pulled from the Russian biologist's uh, website who's working on these eagles. And you can see that the pathway of these various, the colors, this, each color is an individual eagle that has one of these trackers. And this is their map as of today with uh, last winter's data up into through this spring's data. You can see how these birds are moving through uh, Russia, into the Mongolian steppe, down into the, the Middle East towards India, and then into, um, into Africa. So amazing technology that and it's getting nothing but better and better. It seems like every year when I go to these, these sort of biologist meetings and gatherings, just the, the amazing things that researchers are doing with technology to try to untangle the mysteries of migration. So another very important tool that is used, has been used for a while for, for bird migration and is still used very effectively is weather radar. So most birds migrate at night. There are exceptions, uh, but most songbirds, most shorebirds migrate at night. And that's actually quite useful to researchers because then they can be picked up very effectively on weather uh, radar. And birds and um, butterflies and moths, which you can also sometimes track with uh, weather radar if they get into large enough groups, have a different reflectivity than um, clouds and rain. So they can actually pick up what's going on. And I'm about to show a moving photo and watch the shape of these dots, because this is actually quite important. This sort of donut shape is very distinctive with migrating birds, where they, it happens just after sunset, where the birds who were roosting during the day will all take off in a big clump and create this sort of spot donut effect as they begin to move. So this is a really interesting uh, map that, that shows on a particular day, October 16th, um, and then into October 17th, how these birds were moving on one particular night in North America. This lets biologists really track 
exactly when birds are on the move and in the biggest numbers. So it's very, very cool technology. Um, so Luke, this is when that second link should be shared. So Luke's gonna share a link in the chat window about how you can go see predictive maps and modeling. And it's so, so cool. You can look at it in real time. It's really awesome. So Cornell has put together this amazing, you know, crowd available where anybody can access this. This isn't just for, you know, the few wildlife biologists to look at where you can see two things, uh, two main things that Cornell has put together. One is a migration forecast, which is fascinating to look at. You can see what's going to happen predictively tonight and then tomorrow night or the night after. So it's a three day predictive uh, model to see when migration is going to surge in any part of the lower 48 states. And that's really cool for, for birding to try to figure out maybe when a fallout might happen the next morning, or if you go out at night because little passerines, little songbirds migrate at night and it's dark, they call to each other quite frequently. And sometimes if you go out on a night of heavy migration, you can stand outside in your yard and listen and you'll hear them calling as they fly over. So predictive models like this help one uh, you know, plan on when to go out and you have the best chance at you know encountering migrating birds it's really very very cool technology and this is a gift these maps look a little better now but you'll see uh, if you go to that birdcast website they have live maps showing what the radar did in the last 24 hours and you can go to any day and you know within the past year or so and see what happened so this is the one from um may of 2017 showing both the directionality and the intensity of bird migration uh, overnight in the, the lower 48 states. So just amazing technology that has made so much information available to researchers, but also just to all of us, to all of us. You can go on the Cornell site and see this any night of the year. It's really, it's very awesome, very, very amazing technology. So speaking of amazing technology, let's look at some of what Cornell has put together in terms of some of our star migrants. So this is a barn swallow. Um, which amazing migrant, a bird that we do get breeding in Southeast Arizona. And this map on the right is a static field guide map showing where they winter in South America and then breed in North America. This is a map that Cornell released several years ago showing a, a far more dynamic picture of how the birds move throughout the year, which is really cool. And the fact that these birds come from all the way from South America to come to North America, even you know the Tucson area and nest on people's eaves and um, just come all this way just so they can have their babies up here with us, which is just such a fascinating thing to think about. And then here is a more um, modern map. We're gonna see a lot of these, and we did focus on these last class too, because they're just so fascinating. But if you weren't with us on, on uh, session one, these maps are put together by Cornell. You can go to the, the eBird website, and if you go to the science tab, you can see these maps for many, many species, a lot of them freshly released brand new maps very very cool technology and what's going to happen is this bar right here is going to move from january through the months all the way to december and then from yellow to purple is intensity of abundance of the species of question in this case barn swallow and you can see how they move over space and time throughout a year so now that we're coming into spring they surge into north america do their their nesting thing and then you can see them in southeast arizona too and then as we get into fall they surge down through Central America and down into South America. So very, very cool maps that you can explore and watch as many times as you want. It's fascinating. Another star migrant that I think is just such a cool bird is the bank swallow. So this is a bird that is purely a migrant for us. So this is a, um, a map here on the right from the Sibley Field Guide. And you can see that the blue is wintering, the yellow is migration, and the orange is where they will nest. And Arizona is completely in the yellow. So this is a bird throughout the whole state is a migrant coming through. They're a very cute swallow. I do look for them, especially every spring and fall. Uh, they're a little bit smaller than the other swallows. They have this really distinctive chest band or like neck band with a white belly below and a white throat above. So they're quite distinctive. If you can get a good look at, at the swallow that flew by over, you know, a motto pond or something, they're very quite, they're, they're, they're quite noticeable. But really look for bank swallows because they have such an amazing uh, migration thing going on worldwide. So this map here shows the global range of this species where they nest in, um, over here they're known as bank swallows in the Western hemisphere. They're called sand martins in the Eastern hemisphere, but it's the same bird and with the same strategy, nesting up at this high latitude and then wintering at the lower latitudes. 
So here's the eBird map for uh, the Western Hemisphere for this bird. Really tight wintering ground. They move all the way up. They breed through certain parts of North America, all the way up to Alaska, and then back down. So an amazing migration, especially for such a small bird as a swallow, and even a small swallow at that. So this is another amazing migrant that I always get excited when I see coming through because I know that this is a hemisphere level migrant, which is the Swainson's hawk. So we do get some Swainson's hawks that will stick around and nest in Southern Arizona, but most of them are moving through. So a very attractive hawk, very lovely hawk, long pointy wings as you would expect with a long distance flyer and uh, this nice little chestnut bib and dark primaries with um, white secondary. It's a really distinctive hawk and they get in these groups like we're seeing here where it's called kettling where they get in these large groups and because they're a raptor because they're a hawk these are day migrants. Hawks migrate during the day which is quite different from most of the other birds but they are day migrants and they get in these large groups where they'll ride a thermal together as a large group which keeps them in a tight little group known as a kettle and then they'll they'll use that thermal to rise really high up in the sky and then cruise to the next thermal. So it's very cool to see a kettle. Um, you, I have seen them in the spring, but I feel like I see them even more in the fall as they move down through um, Arizona on their, their journey south. So you can see here from this map, this hemisphere level static map, that the blue here, their wintering range is actually quite small in Argentina, very, very tiny wintering range. So let's watch their movement map. So very small uh, wintering range, and then they just surge up into to North America, only in the west, do their, their nesting thing, and then they surge back down. So amazing migration for a hawk. But the absolute winner of the migration game is the Arctic Tern. This is the longest flying migrant in the world. Uh, they have an amazing migration journey. They circumnavigate the globe twice in a single year. I mean, they, they do the distance as if they circumnavigated the globe twice in a year. And these photos were actually taken at Kanoa Ranch. So this is a migrant that should be on many birders' minds that live in Southeast Arizona uh, since a very exciting one turned up a few weeks back at Kanoa Ranch uh, down near Green Valley that was flying over the pond there looking for some prey. And then this, so this photo down here is the Arctic Tern with the foothills of the Santa Rita Mountains behind it. And uh, this map's really cool too, because it shows that they breed very far north and that their migration is usually over the open ocean. But Arctic Terns are a global species. This is a bird that wanders the, the whole world where they winter down in the South Pole <laughs> and then will breed very close to the North Pole. And they are absolutely in the, the, the Arctic Circle breeding around the entire world. So you have to look at one of these maps that shows the whole globe. It's an amazing species. And they are nesting extremely far north and then traveling the world to, to winter extremely far south. So very, very cool bird. They average about 25,000 miles every year on their round trip journey. And one bird that had one of those tags on it is now the record holder for the longest migrant and he did 59,000 miles. So an amazing, amazing bird. It was so exciting to see one in Green Valley and know that these birds are such amazing world travelers, really, really cool birds. And this is an, and they're quite small too. This is an Arctic tern that I saw in Shetland, which is an island, you know, in Northern Scotland, uh, attacking local birding guide, Richard Frey, as he was trying to get a photo of it. And cause we were right there near some uh, breeding grounds in Shetland. United Kingdom, which is, you see it's a tiny bird, but with very, very long wings, as you would expect to see on a long distance migrant. So bird migration is an amazing, you know, intriguing, beautiful phenomenon, but it's also a really big deal for birds that do it. It is the most dangerous time in a bird's life. Um, a migrant bird, uh, you know, a member of a, of a migrating bird species is more likely to die during migration than any other stage of their life. So it's an amazingly dangerous thing that birds do. It's very taxing. There's tons of natural threats that they face, you know, storms and, you know, lack of food or all sorts of things that can kill them off on the journey or just exhaustion. And now there's all sorts of new threats that, you know, humanity has thrown in their way in terms of power lines and communication towers and buildings and all sorts of problems that, you know, barriers that birds can face, you know, window strikes. And so it's an incredibly dangerous thing that birds do. 
yet they do it. So here's, here's a yellow-billed cuckoo. This is a species that we've done a lot of work with in Southeast Arizona, excuse me, at Tucson Audubon in Southeast Arizona, kind of one of our, our star conservation projects we've been working on for uh, five years where we were tracking yellow-billed cuckoo. So this map is gonna illustrate why Arizona was such an important study site. So this is, the bar is moving through the calendar year and watch this region in particular as we hit spring. So the Eastern area just explodes with cuckoo sightings in the spring and then in June, Arizona lights up. And that's very significant because what's going on is the Western yellow-billed cuckoo is a distinct population segment that has been listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act for the last several years. So this is a bird that it has legal protection status, the Western population of yellow-billed cuckoo, because they've had staggering declines over the last century, absolutely staggering declines. But Tucson Audubon's surveys of the Sky Island regions, the mountain ranges of Southeast Arizona found cuckoos nesting in the Madrean Sky Islands. So this is a map showing where Tucson Audubon did surveys for five years. The yellow is where we surveyed um, and the red dots and blue dots is where we actually found cuckoos. So you can see we found a fair amount of cuckoos uh, sometimes in the rivers of Arizona as you would expect with this riparian species but also up in the mountains. So really very close to home for, for Tucson Audubon and Southeast Arizona. This is a range map showing where they winter in South America migrate through Central America and Mexico, and then have a breeding range throughout the Eastern United States, sort of the Eastern population of yellow-billed cuckoo. And then this Western segment, you see they have so few places in the American West, which is why the bird was listed. It used to be much more extensive breeding habitat. And that they're in Southeast Arizona in, in pretty good you know, coverage according to this map, and then using the Sierra Madre archipelago of Mexico. But let's go to the moving cuckoo map. So starting in the winter time, they're in Argentina, they move north, they surge through eastern, here they are in the Sky Islands of Southeast Arizona, and then once you hit October, they just drain out. So very cool, informative map showing us a lot of information. But, so yellow-billed cuckoos are amazing long-distance hemisphere-level migrants, but let's meet the pearly-breasted cuckoo. I think, I suspect many birders in Arizona are not aware of pearly-breasted cuckoo and that it even exists. I wasn't until about two years ago. This is an amazing bird that looks very familiar <laughs> to anyone who's ever seen a yellow-billed cuckoo in Arizona. This is a species that is very, very closely related to yellow-billed cuckoo, looks incredibly similar, very, very similar. And here is a range map showing that they are year-round in South America. This is a, a very closely related bird that does not migrate. They hang out in this area all winter. Uh, the places where the yellow-billed cuckoos are hanging out in the winter as well, they're often in the same habitats in the winter, except when spring comes, the yellow-billed cuckoos leave and fly to North America, and the pearly-breasted cuckoos stay behind. They are so closely related genetically that they're very difficult to tell apart. So difficult, in fact, that did you notice there was a yellow-billed cuckoo on this slide? This one here in the red box is actually a yellow-billed cuckoo. But I wanted to put one in here with these guys so you could see just how closely related they are. Their tail spots are incredibly similar. The only real difference that um, experts looking through binoculars look for to try to tell the two apart when they're both there in the wintering, wintering time is the fact that our yellow-billed cuckoo has rufus in the wings and the pearly-breasted lacks that. But this is an incredibly closely related bird with a totally different breeding strategy. So just a fascinating example of uh, that leads to our next question is why do birds even migrate like it's a fascinating question you know we spend so much research and time and technology trying to figure out exactly how and when birds migrate but why is such a difficult question and still relatively philosophical I mean the basics of it is that birds wouldn't do it if it wasn't to their advantage so this happens with flying too like why do birds fly it's incredibly taxing you know energy taxing for them to do it so why do they even do it they do it because it's to their advantage to do so right so it helps them escape predators it helps them move around and find food and migration is on a similar sort of uh, philosophy scale when you're thinking about why birds do anything so they obviously do it because it's to their advantage they wouldn't do it if it wasn't so but and migration also has to be thought of as happening on different scales so phantopepla is a fascinating one where in the spring, it's, 
This has been suspected for a while, but has recently been proven using some of this new tracking technology. The Phanopepla will breed in the spring, will have a nest in the Sonoran Desert, and we're used to seeing them in mistletoe, you know, in the Tucson area. Uh, they do that in the, the winter, they're here, and then in the spring, they have their first nest. And then the whole population will actually move <laughs> to oak woodland habitat for the summer, where it gets too hot in the Sonoran Desert, presumably. They move towards oak, oak woodland, sometimes just moving up hills into the, the mountains up here, or some cases, the birds in Arizona will actually leave and go to California to the coastal oak woodland and nest in two, loca two locations every year. It's actually a pretty rare strategy for, uh, for birds and can is definitely a migration that they're doing. It's a very interesting, fascinating, smaller scale migration. So if that map, see how they're becoming less abundant. So there they are in this, then we get this summer, they're less frequent in Arizona and more frequent in California. And then they come back. So it's a fascinating movement that phanopeplas do. But long distance migrants are really a tangle that researchers are absolutely still working on. This is a, a field of trying to understand why birds do this that is still being looked at. And it's just such a huge, fascinating topic. But there's some things that we can definitely infer and figure out in terms of the motivations for why birds would do such a dangerous, you know, taxing thing um, every year, you know, these huge journeys. So there's two primary resources that they're looking for, that they are motivating them to do these journeys, and that's food and nesting locations. So weather, geography, food sources, and probably most importantly, day length is something that is luring these birds away from the tropics, away from the equator. So the seasonal abundance of insect food and the greater day length. So when you go up into, you know, famously, you know, the, the 23 hour, day in northern Alaska or up in the Arctic Circle, that is the sort of thing that is going to draw birds because this huge day length is going to create these huge gluts of food. These huge insect um, hatches that happen up in the, the Arctic during, you know, the, the, long, the long days of summer and just the amount, amazing amount of food as well as just time that the birds can be feeding the, the young. I mean, they can be feeding for 23 hours straight when you have a 23 hour long day, which means your young are going to grow incredibly fast, which is going to reduce, you know, dangers of predation. And it also is just more successful. So studies have found that these migrant birds that travel towards these areas of longer day length in the spring and summer have more young on average. So four to six on average as, as a pair versus their stay at home tropical relatives of two to three on average. So they're doing it because it is advantageous to them and it helps them create more babies successfully. So it's such a drive for, for all animals, but it, this really birds have the ability to go to places to make that happen. And in terms of how this happened, the evolution of this evolving over time is still definitely a cutting edge area where researchers and scientists are, are working on it. No one has a great explanation yet on many bird groups on how this even happened. Because you have to think both in terms of huge scale of time, geologic levels of time, but also how geography has changed, how you know ice ages have come and gone, how mountains have risen and valleys have fallen. So it's an incredibly large, esoteric, philosophical concept that is still being worked on quite a lot. And it's absolutely fascinating. So migratory birds, um, are an amazing group of birds, but they are also facing a lot of challenges and uh, data now shows facing some declines. So this is from the 3 billion bird study that hit the mainstream media uh, quite effectively, uh, hopefully this last fall and winter where you know 3 billion missing birds and this is the infographic for the category of migratory birds that um, you know over the last 50 years, 2.5 billion migratory birds were lost. 28% population decreased in migrant birds in North America, and that two in five Baltimore Orioles, as an example, have been lost since 1970. So now we're gonna transition over to uh, Nicole for, for her policy information. All right, so how much did everyone just learn? I feel like my brain is no longer capable of taking in it. Any more information, it's leaking out. <laughs> so that was great. Uh, <laughs> um, I agree we're going to have to have more presentations on this because I feel like we're going to have questions uh, coming out of everywhere. You've only led to more questions, Jenny. Yeah, fascinating. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do here, um, we're going to run through this relatively quickly because I'm going to be teasing you all with some additional presentations we're going to be having on all of these topics. Um, we take a quick step back. My motivation for kind of having this series is all about the Migratory Bird Protection Act and Migratory Bird Tre Tre Treaty Act. And we talked a little bit about the Treaty Act last week. Um, and so I'm not going to go over a lot of that introductory information again, but if you have questions, definitely let me know. Um, but so we just heard about all these crazy migrations again, and we can kind of only imagine the challenges these, these birds are facing along the way. And my guess is most of us here on this presentation care about this because we intrinsically care about birds and want them to continue living. Um, and back in the day when we wrote the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, it's you know over 100 years old now, um, we were thinking about how can we protect birds along every step of their migration. Um, and that's really key, right, because we need to think about not just their breeding habitats, not just their wintering habitats, but also the journeys that they're making and every stop along that path can hold different challenges and different dangers. And these migrations and these birds themselves have taught us so much through that entire time, right? We've learned so much from birds and we as humans stand to lose a lot um, if these birds lose protections and continue this massive scale species decline, right? Birds teach us about climate change. We're gonna have a talk about that. Birds teach us about uh, disease and pandemics. We're gonna have a talk about that. And so we stand to lose a lot with the loss of these birds. So this is a picture that I took here in Tucson, one of my first birding trips ever actually. And I was like, man, look at this little pond of water and how many birds are here. And I know we've all had that experience. Birds, when they're coming down from their migrations, are looking for water, they're looking for resources, right? Unfortunately for birds, when they look at this pond, they actually don't know if that's a safe place to land, right? So as humans, we know this is a safe, uh, safe plot of water. It's actually treated water, so it's extra safe. Um, but that very well could also be an oil uh, pit, right? It could be a mining's tailing pond. Birds don't know that. Um, and they face a lot of hazards just by taking that risk of landing somewhere. And um, so this is just a couple of examples here. I also want to make the point that taking care of these sites, and I'll, again, we're going to talk about this a lot more later, is actually really easy. So here at the bottom here are some recommended ways that we can help protect birds from hazardous sites. This is an oil tank. So rather than having open oil pits, which is kind of the standard for the industry, you can just put it in tanks. Not that difficult, right, you would think. Um, you can also just cover ponds really simply with uh, bird netting and just making sure that it's maintained, right? So these are practices that are encouraged by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. They're not required. Um, it's not so much a regulation as a byproduct of having something like the Treaty Act that will punish you if you do cause harm to birds. So if this was an open pit and we had an incident like we had in Montana, a couple of years ago where migrating birds come down, land in that toxic pond and die, um, you can be, as an industry, be held accountable for that. But because this kind of punishment is theoretically in place, right, it causes an incentive reverse to have industry protect these sites and help prevent bird deaths. And that's really what we're looking for, right? We don't want to see thousands of birds die um, to, to have to trigger protections. That's not the ideal situation. So Jenny, if you go to the next slide. Click forward one, there you go. So I hate putting up pictures of dead birds. <laughs> um, so I only have one here, but um, this is just, we're gonna talk a little bit about what's happening to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act right now. So why are we even talking about this? Why is this something we need to focus on? Well, because like many other environmental rules and regulations, there have been some recent changes made at the Fish and Wildlife Service to how the treaty is actually, actually implemented. So within the, the uh, treaty language, 
is this thing called incidental take. So if you harm a bird, right, if you shoot down a bird and you know what you're doing, you're doing it on purpose, right? And that's a pretty clear act of harm to birds. But what if you didn't exactly mean to kill or harm a bird in your action? This becomes a little bit of a gray area, though it seems pretty clear to me, but let's talk legally, right? If you have an oil spill or if your power line malfunctions um, or something along those things, something that you couldn't foresee, that's called incidental, right? So something you did caused harm to birds, but you didn't mean it right off the bat. So the new interpretation, this is kind of gets into some legalese, but um, when there's a law, the agency responsible for that law can choose how they implement it and choose how they interpret what the language means. So now under new operating procedure, um, actually officially confirmed this morning, according to my newsfeed, incidental take is no longer covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So if you think about something like Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which is uh, very much still in the uh, forefront of a lot of people's minds that I know, that killed uh, a, a million birds and led to a fine of $100 million. That would no longer be covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So not only is it a loss of bird life, it's a huge loss of that incentive on the company, right, to not be fined $100 million. So this is a little complicated, and there's a lot more I could tell you on this, but again, we're going to be focusing on this for another webinar, both about the Migratory Bird Treaty rollbacks and what exactly that means procedurally, and then what we can do for policy, so Jenny can go to the next slide, to fix this. So to me, I honor the treaty because it's very important for protecting birds and I intrinsically care about birds. Now, of course, that isn't the case for everyone and isn't the case for a lot of politicians who have tons and tons of other things to worry about. Um, but we are working to move forward a piece, a piece of legislation called the Migratory Bird Protection Act. Very similar to Treaty Act, a little confusing. Um, but the Protection Act would essentially remove this vague interpretation of incidental take, codify that back into the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and say, yeah, we definitely meant incidental take when we talked about harm to birds. We're going to put that really clearly back into the law. It also includes a couple other points that will strengthen the act to make this kind of interpretation not possible. Um, again, going to talk about that a lot more in another webinar. So you can come geek out with me on all that another time. Um, and then Tucson Audubon is also particularly concerned about this because as we talked about last week, Arizona is a really important place for migration, right? Just uniquely situated and we host so many important birds. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Jenny, we're going to be honoring the treaty by doing a whole campaign focusing on the migratory birds that we see here in Arizona. So we're calling it free to fly because we want to keep those birds free to fly. Um, and we're going to be asking all of you and really anyone else who cares or is interested about in birds to submit your migratory bird story. And why that's useful for me in particular, but also Tucson Audubon, is we can help bring those personalized stories, almost humanize this issue for decision makers. And I can share this, this grouping of stories. We're going to make a, a virtual flyway story map out of it. And I can share these, these personalized stories uh, with decision makers to explain that we all care about birds and in particular care about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, want to see it strengthened, want to see it brought back and improved for, for the future. So this actually just launched yesterday, so fresh off the press. If you go to our website, Free to Fly is now prominently on the top page, and you're going to be getting tons of emails about it. Um, there's a process where you can actually go to the super long list of birds that come to Arizona. Pick your favorite. doesn't have to be your favorite. It might be just a bird you're interested in. Sign up for it, and then start thinking creatively about maybe a story you had where you saw that bird, or just something you think that is interesting about that bird, 
or if you want to creatively express why you care about that bird. Um, and then you're going to send it to us and we're going to put together this beautiful virtual flyway. So again, there's a lot more information on this on the website and we're going to be having two more webinars that specifically walk through how you can participate in virtual flyway. So that's the teaser on that. And I think now we should take questions, Jenny, because we're, we're coming up to the end of our hour here. Go, to the, uh, go back to the, the view where we can all see each other again. Yeah, yeah there you go. There's everyone's there face. Hey, what, one question we had was, do we have a complete list of all the birds that migrate through Arizona? And I think we've been working on that, right? Yeah, so it starts getting a little bit complicated when you're talking oh, about yeah. just, migratory, just migratory birds as we might think of them. Um, we wanted to focus on birds that were covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So that's kind of our qualifier. Um, so if you go to the Virtual Flyaway webpage, you can look at the list of birds um, that come through Arizona that are common. We took out a lot of the major rarities just to make the list not so overwhelming. Uh, and you can see that full list of 320 species um, that, that migrate here through to or from Arizona um, and that you can sign up for. Yeah, and it is complicated because Arizona is such a big state. So we did work yeah. out a list of species that are the ones that strictly, like the bank swallow, where all of Arizona is just on their pathway. They don't winter or breed here. I think it's complicated because a lot of species will migrate through, for instance, southeast Arizona, but nest in northern Arizona. It's such a big yeah. state with such different habitats that it gets complicated real fast in terms of, mm -hmm. okay, so bird migrates, a short distance migrant versus a long distance migrant. So it's, it's, it's complicated, like migration yeah. itself. Yeah, so the birds you see on that list, you know, they don't have to be migrating per se where you are to count as a migratory bird under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So check out the list. Um, and if you have any questions about it, definitely let us know. I actually looked at the list earlier and I have a question. <laughs> ah, Luke, what's your question? <laughs> uh, I didn't see common gallinule on there. Is that, should be one that should be on there? Yeah, I think so, right? Yeah, it's, it's certainly a wintering bird we get. Yeah, it should be. <laughs> now, I don't know, that might no not be reason. on the and I can't imagine why it wouldn't be. Yeah. yeah the only so reason it, I, because I uh, had a picture of one, I was thinking possibly. Yeah. I picked that, that one, bird. and it wasn't there. It wasn't uh, there. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, we'll look at that. I'm, You've I'm already really, found a problem, Luke. A different one, though. Um, uh, let's see. We had a question about uh, Tucson Audubon and building collisions. Uh, what are we doing to help people prevent window strikes with buildings? And uh, Olia did respond to that. Olia is our um, citizen science uh, coordinator. She's on with us right now too. Excellent. Um, but do you, any yes. of you, uh, Nicole, Jenny, or Olia, do you have anything to add to what Tucson Audubon is doing with uh, in regard to building collisions? So, so window strikes or building collisions is a huge issue and I did actually have some slides in this talk and Nicole and I decided it was already cutting a little close to an hour so we we did remove those that'll have to be in a future talk but it was originally in this talk because it is such an important cause of mortality for migrating birds and a lot of it has to do with the fact these birds migrate at night and buildings are often illuminated at night so it has to do with artificial light at night as well it's it's a big enough topic to be its own talk which i'm sure we'll do in the future uh just not is joining other conservation groups that have lights out programs and you know window strike prevention programs to, you know try sharing information on how to make your windows less dangerous for birds as well as trying to do coordinated you know uh, lights out programs during peak migration. So Tucson Audubon is working on that and Olia is actively working on launching that program very soon. And if Olia, if you're there, if you want to uh, add anything, please do. Yeah, I think Jenny, you covered it really well. Uh, we got a big uh, grant from National Audubon to jumpstart our program here. This is going to cover residential area bird strikes where most of uh, bird fatalities happen. Um, it's also going to cover lights out for some of the high-rise buildings that we have. We don't have many, but it does affect the migration period, so we will encourage 
managers to turn off lights during peak migration periods in spring and fall. So stay tuned, it will be rolling out soon and we'll make sure to have a talk about that as well. Yeah, wow. that's a fascinating topic that everyone can help with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cool that we've already started digging, yeah. digging into that. So that's great. Thanks, Olya. Um, do, do any of you have uh, any other questions that we can touch on right now? use your little raise hand function. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, oh, uh, Catherine asks, uh, do the submissions for the Flyway project have a deadline? That's a, that's a very good concrete question that uh, we can bring up. Um, yes. And for now, no, because I'm curious to see what kinds of submissions we're going to get. We're really encouraging for people to think creatively about this. And I know that can take time. <laughs> so I already know some people that are planning to do like paintings and drawings and that kind of thing takes time. And I wanna make sure everyone has enough time to make that happen. I don't have like some um, like really important policy deadline coming up where I wanna use this. Um, so it's gonna be rolling and we'll see um, how, how, how people do. Cool, but don't drag your feet, right? Well, yeah, if you've got an idea, let's, <laughs> let's do it right now. <laughs> or if yeah, you don't you have one, fall migration's time. coming. Fall migration's right. coming. So you can maybe yeah. try to, you know, pick a migrant and try to find them this coming fall. And some species start migrating, start their fall migration in what is definitely summer <laughs> for here. The Rufus hummingbirds start moving through in August. And uh, Nicole, uh, you're going to be uh, giving a presentation on, on Wednesday about this, right? At one o'clock. Yep. And that one's already up on the website, right, Luke? It's already up. People can sign up. I'll put that link in the, uh, the email, recap email that I send out later this afternoon, uh, along with some of these um, links to like the bird cast and all the migration stuff that we, uh, that Jenny shared with us uh, earlier. Um, so unless there's any other questions, we'll uh, I'm gonna unmute folks and um, then we'll we'll call it an afternoon. Thank you so much, Nicole and, and Jenny and and Olia for participating there too. Thank you guys. Oh, you guys are a great audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Happy birding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That mm. Eagle website that someone asked for the link for, I'll, I'll get that to you, Luke. It, the site is in Russian, though, which Olya will be able to read, but... Olya can translate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that map was probably one of the coolest I've seen. And then, yeah, that was up to date as of today, that map. It's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so go ahead and send that to me, and then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll send out the recap here once the recording's done. So... Thanks. Thanks to both of you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. See you later. Bye, everyone. Happy Friday. Bye.